Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mark Christensen, and this is Dan Woods. We're both principal engineers in the uh, cloud and compute division of Target. Uh, I am principal engineer for the OpenStack team, and Dan is in our uh, sales and uh, retail operations, uh, also known as stores. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, I'm just going to do a quick introduction, and then uh, Dan's going to do the bulk of the presentation, and then we'll both be available for some questions afterwards. Uh, I know Dan needs to catch a plane, so uh, we're going to need to finish up uh, pretty promptly, but um, we'll answer as many questions as we can. Um, so Target, uh, as you can imagine, we have some pretty large uh, operations, and um, for several years, we've been in various public clouds, and for about two years, we have uh, had OpenStack. Um, and over the years, we've had various different uh, kinds of software that we use for deployment, but um, they, they were internal, they were proprietary, uh, and they were generally tailored um, to specifically to the particular platform onto which uh, the deployments were happening. So about six months ago, um, we uh, started uh, working with Spinnaker uh, to try to get a coherent uh, CD pipeline across all of the deployment environments that, uh, that we use, uh, internal and external. Um, and about four months ago, we were uh, very fortunate to uh, have Dan join us. Uh, <laughs> Dan was uh, the, the original and principal developer on the Spinnaker project, so we're really glad to have him. And uh, uh, Dan has come, and his main focus is actually getting Spinnaker now to the point where we use Spinnaker to deploy not only to our internal and external cloud platforms, but uh, directly uh, to our 1,800 stores. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan, and uh, he'll uh, let you know how that works. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, yeah, no, uh, no, no small task, uh, believe me when I say that, uh, but it should be interesting. Uh, great. Thanks, everybody, for, for, uh, for showing up for this. Um, just real quick, before we even get started, I, ju I just want to know how many folks here uh, actually have heard of Spinnaker? Okay. Vast majority of the room. That's great. How many folks are using it? Okay, all right, <laughs> great. How many folks are planning to use it? Okay, and so it seems like the remaining group is here just to learn more of what it is, right? That sound about right? Okay, excellent. Uh, great, yeah, so as Mark mentioned, uh, I'm a principal engineer. I'm, I'm currently working on um, the stores platform. Uh, to, uh, to, to be able to continuously deliver out to our stores environment. Now that's something separate from what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, today what I'm gonna talk about is the, uh, the Spinnaker integration with OpenStack, and I'm doing that primarily because this is an OpenStack conference, right? And so that makes sense. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Just right out of the gates, what is Spinnaker? Very simply put, uh, Spinnaker is a project that was developed uh, by Netflix uh, as a replacement to their, uh, their prior solution, which was known as Asgard. Now, Asgard enabled teams within uh, Netflix to uh, deliver to AWS uh, in, in a way that uh, pretty much hadn't been done before, right? It facilitated their, their mechanism for continuous delivery. Now, Spinnaker is an evolution on that that brings together all of the parts necessary for uh, a true continuous delivery pipeline to be able to say that you check in code and something will happen with that code, like it gets built, for example, an artifact gets generated, and then that artifact in turn uh, generates an, another artifact, an image that we can then uh, take and, and go out and deploy. Now, Spinnaker has turned into a, a cross-organizational uh, uh, initiative where uh, multiple uh, companies and multiple teams uh, across multiple companies are, are collaborating on it to bring uh, basically a multi-cloud presence to Spinnaker's capabilities. Now, whereas Asgard was designed uh, from the outset to target AWS, which is primarily where Netflix's runtime uh, is, uh, Spinnaker was designed with the idea in mind that that being able to uh, take this philosophy of continuous delivery and immutable deployments 
uh, across multiple clouds would, would enable uh, basically an open source community around the project that, that ultimately would result in a, a much better, uh, much more engaged and, and a much more versatile project for uh, a bunch of different teams. So in that respect, it's, we can effectively say this is a global continuous delivery platform, right? So if you're an organization who is running in uh, one or many clouds, or for example, if you have a public cloud footprint like with uh, Amazon or Google or, or whatever, and then you have uh, data center uh, cloud capabilities as well, say with OpenStack or Kubernetes or, or, uh, or any other mechanism that Spinnaker supports, um, you can use the same tool the same patterns and uh, this pretty much the exact same pipelines to deploy your code out to the to uh, across all those environments. Now, this this really opens the door quite a bit for uh, for release engineering teams, which is really who Spinnaker I think uh, benefits the most uh, are the folks who uh, effectively own the underlying infrastructure but want to enable a mechanism for application development teams to be able to get their software out much uh, much more quickly. Um, so. In, in that respect, uh, we, we have the multi-cloud support that's, that's built in, uh, and then there's also a, 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 a measure, I would say, of, of cloud management, right? Where you can deal with all of the resources and artifacts that exist in a cloud uh, in a way that makes much more sense than just dealing with, say, instances and load balancers and directly interfacing with security groups. Uh, I think, as probably everybody knows in here, uh, dealing with these things on an individual level, it, it can be really disjointed, right? It can be somewhat difficult to, to kind of wrap your head around, and especially if you're an application team that doesn't want to have to worry about the infrastructure and you want to be able to move very quickly uh, and, and do things in, in a more streamlined way. Spinnaker allows those teams to, to work with those resources in, in the context that they care about, which is their application, right? And so that's a, that's a really uh, kind of a nice thing. And now even, even more than that, this allows you to have a scalable infrastructure. And so when we talk about infrastructure and scaling at this level of doing things, really what we're talking about is enabling a, a vast number of teams to do their jobs, right? So in terms of, in terms of scale, request per second, and, and, and those kind of things, at the infrastructure layer, that, that stuff, it obviously matters, right? But, but it doesn't matter as much as, as how quickly we can empower teams to, uh, to deliver their software, right? And how, how much we don't need to get involved with their day-to-day -day when they need to do a release uh, or anything like that. So these are the kind of things that Spinnaker really opens the door on and, and does a really good job with. And it does this by working with deployments uh, through immutable pipelines. And immutable pipelines are really the bread and butter uh, that, that Spinnaker brings to the table. It's the area that I think we, we should focus on a lot, and it's, it's stuff that we're, we're going to look at today and, um, and talk about. And even more than that, there's this idea, this concept of deployment strategies in Spinnaker. And deployment strategies basically are a way of saying that, that you have uh, what we could call a, a blessed way of, uh, of delivering uh, software to the cloud, right? And uh, as part of that, you want to be able to share that concept across multiple projects or across multiple deployments within, uh, within your own application uh, and, and do that in a way that works best for your organization, for your teams, for the projects that you care about. And we'll talk more about this uh, as we go. The third aspect of this is that we have zero downtime deployments, right? This is extremely important, highly available deployments, right? So that we don't, uh, so that we don't have any service disruption as teams need to uh, need to roll out um, to roll out software and also the the mechanism for pipelines enables you to create canary deployments these these alternative paths that consume a bit of the traffic where you can monitor metrics and you can see uh, the new changes live without them affecting the full scope of 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 your production deployment and last but certainly not least is this idea of chaos engineering who here is familiar with with um, uh, with chaos monkey yeah, just about everybody, right? So this is a big deal. So the new version of Chaos Monkey only runs through Spinnaker, right? And, and Spinnaker's ability to, to run pipelines and to act as a pipeline executor uh, really facilitates that ability. So having Spinnaker in your infrastructure, you're immediately going to be set up to, to succeed with this kind of failure injection testing, right? So I want to talk a little bit about what Spinnaker is not, and I think that this is important uh, because it's, it's easy to look at a, a tool like this, especially when it provides the level of capabilities that it does, 
Uh, and, and just very quickly short circuit where I'm sure that a lot of your minds are going. Uh, and let's just start out by saying right out of the gate, Spinnaker is not a platform as a service. Okay, it doesn't provide that full end-to-end -end, uh, everything in the middle that, that you would possibly need, and it's not a replacement for your existing infrastructure, right? What Spinnaker is, as simply put as I possibly can, is release engineering, okay? It's the mechanism that application teams are uh, empowered to, uh, to, to use to deliver software continuously to the cloud, whether that's public cloud, private cloud, containers with Kubernetes, uh, whatever you wanna do. Second point here is that Spinnaker is not an abstraction over the cloud. So there is a common model. There is a, a we'll call it a set of guardrails that uh, different cloud implementations need to operate within. Uh, but as far as, as far as abstracting away the capabilities of what the underlying infrastructure is able to do or is doing, it doesn't do that, right? And that was a conscious decision to say that if we try to abstract the cloud, uh, away from all of these underlying providers, we're never gonna get it right, right? And there are gonna be capabilities in AWS that, that don't fit into OpenStack, and there are gonna be capabilities in OpenStack that don't fit into Google Cloud, and so forth and so on, right? So it's, it's not an abstraction over the cloud, but maybe you could consider it a, a molding, right? So there, there are some common set of uh, data, there is a common set of data model to represent your infrastructure, but it gets out of the way really quickly when you need to do something that's very specific, right? And so we'll, we'll show you some of that kind of stuff too. And, and again, as I said before, Spinnaker is not a replacement for your infrastructure layer, right? It's a way to enable uh, app teams, like I said, to think about the infrastructure uh, in, in a way that makes sense to them, which is their application footprint, right? Not instances separated from server groups or heat templates or whatever the case might be, right? It's just about them being able to see what their cloud deployment is and be able to build pipelines around that so that they can safely deliver software. So again, cross cloud, this is a really big, really big aspect because it, it opens the door quite a bit. And at present, uh, there are implementations for Amazon, Kubernetes, uh, Google Cloud, OpenStack, uh, Azure, uh, as I understand it, is a work in progress, but it, it thrives nonetheless. Uh, Cloud Foundry, a lot of work has been done there. And, uh, and recently, I think that uh, Oracle has picked it up with their bare, bare metal cloud service. So they're providing a, a cloud driver implementation. And we're, we're also pretty privileged today to have uh, the folks from Veritas in the group who uh, have also collaborated on the uh, OpenStack implementation, which is a big deal because being able to drive OpenStack with Spinnaker is something that was built uh, in conjunction, uh, a, a joint effort between Target and Veritas uh, to provide this, uh, this implementation for you to be able to, uh, to work with OpenStack. And it works with the OpenStack V3 APIs, um, which is called, what's the name? Oh, uh, yeah, well, so Mataka. 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 Mataka, right. I can never get that right. <laughs> Mataka it is. Uh, and, and furthermore, beyond that, now, th this I think is an equally big deal, is that the, the manner by which Spinnaker is, is driving uh, the, the OpenStack um, uh, details under the covers really falls in line with what the best practices for doing this kind of stuff are, right? And that, that I think is an important thing, because if you, try to, if you try to touch the infrastructure directly for every deployment, uh, that an application team needs to be able to do, you're gonna get a thousand different ways of doing it, right? So the way that Spinnaker talks to OpenStack, there's, there's pretty much just one, one path of, of doing any, any one thing in particular, and that's, uh, that's kind of a nice thing. It's, it's reproducible, we'll say. So like I said, Spinnaker does have some level of a model uh, that exists around it, right? And these are just common things that we know are going to exist at all cloud providers, right? And, and common constructs that, uh, that need to be in place for us to be able to do things like build up those pipelines and build up a, a really nice presentation layer for you to be able to manage your, your application footprint. So at the very top, we have this concept of an application. And an, an application represents any credentialed target uh, that can potentially be for, for deployments, right? So say an AWS account, or say a, a project in OpenStack. We'll talk more about the, uh, the corollary types. A cluster belongs to an application, and a cluster is some grouping of version server groups. And a server group 
is a homogeneous set of versioned instances. So you have a version of your application, right? And you say uh, version 1.0.0 and I need five instances. Now that creates a server group that corresponds to version 1.0.0 uh, so that we know at any given point in time, those five instances that exist within that server group are all gonna be the same version. They're all gonna have the same configuration. They're all gonna be launched with the same configuration details. Now if we create uh, a new version of our, our software and we roll it out, that'll create a new server group uh, with five new instances that, that correspond to say version 1.0.1, .1, right? Or something, something to that effect. And then of course an instance is exactly what it sounds like. It's a virtual machine uh, in our case. Uh, load balancers are also there and, uh, and security groups. And these are, I think, pretty straightforward uh, things. Does anyone not know what these things are? Virtual machines, everyone knows what virtual machines are? Okay, all right, just testing the waters here. So in terms of uh, the OpenStack integration, Spinnaker's model, data model, uh, maps pretty cleanly to OpenStack, honestly. Uh, an account is an OpenStack project, and you have some uh, credentials that are able to, to, to access that OpenStack project. Cluster is really sort of a, a a meta thing, so there's, there's really no difference here. Uh, a server group is an OpenStack stack, uh, and it's, it's driven by a heat template. An instance is a virtual machine, uh, which is lifecycle managed by the stack. Uh, a load balancer is an LBAS uh, V2 object. Uh, I believe it doesn't work with V1. Correct, it doesn't work with V1. Uh, and a security group is exactly the same as you would find in OpenStack, right? So these, this is a pretty clean integration, which is really nice, right? Because it doesn't take a big cognitive shift to step away from uh, just your, your regular OpenStack way of thinking about things and then jump into the, the Spinnaker mindset around things. And we don't always find that, <laughs> which, is, which is great for our purposes. Now, does anybody work with OpenStack, anybody else here, I should say, work with OpenStack at a very fundamental level? the individual pieces, is anybody on like the base infrastructure team? Okay, cool, so a couple folks. Okay, so this will feel uh, familiar, <laughs> I should say, for you. Spinnaker's components. I wanna talk a little bit about the way that Spinnaker is, is architected and the way that it's put together. So Spinnaker is a microservice architecture, right? Uh, and it has a, a set of optional components that can be included or not as, as your uh, deployment could see fit. Uh, and then the, the purpose behind doing uh, individual microservices for the different functionality uh, of the system is so that they can be developed, they can be upgraded, they can be scaled, they can be configured uh, according to uh, anything that they need without a full rollout being necessary of, of the underlying system. Um, and that's kind of nice. So we'll talk about what some of these components are. So Spinnaker has uh, some central components and these are basically the, the heart, these are the heart and soul of what Spinnaker does. This is what drives everything. At the very top of this list, we have the cloud driver, and that's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Uh, this basically manages all the communications with any of the backend clouds. So in our case, we would talk about this with OpenStack. This is what actually talks to the OpenStack APIs. Uh, in turn, it's also responsible for uh, observing any state changes at that cloud. So it does this periodic polling. Uh, of the OpenStack endpoints to see new, new instances were launched, new server groups were created, uh, new, new load balancers that might be available, server groups, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then it takes all that stuff and it throws it into a cache so that it's very quickly accessible. And it, it, it then takes that cache and it can turn it into those Spinnaker model objects that, that we care about later on. The next thing that we have is Orca. Orca is a, uh, it's a very clever name, if I do say so. Uh, for the central orchestration engine. And this is pretty much what does all of the work of uh, making Cloud Driver do its thing. This is also the mechanism that drives those immutable pipelines. So we create a pipeline definition, we put some details into that about how, uh, how we wanna do a rollout or a deployment that we wanna do, and then Orca is responsible for making calls to, uh, to Cloud Driver and, uh, and getting feedback from Cloud Driver to, uh, to see if a stage had succeeded or, or anything like that. Uh, third, but certainly not the least important of the central components is uh, a project called Front50. 
And again, keep in mind, these are all microservices, right? So they're, they're individually deployable. They can be managed uh, on their own. Front 50 is responsible for storing and serving application metadata. And this metadata includes things like who is the owner of an application? Uh, what, what port does an application run on? What does this application do, right? That kind of stuff. And then on top of that, it's also responsible for things like uh, storing pipeline definitions for, uh, for how you roll things out. So you go into Spinnaker and you build a pipeline that speaks to how you'll deliver your, your application, uh, and that gets stored via Front 50 and then is recalled later via Front 50's APIs. And now an important thing about this is that part of the integration with OpenStack is that uh, Front 50 can use uh, a Swift object store to be able to store this data as well, right? So we can, we, we can really dig deep into our incorporation into the OpenStack platform. Some of the optional components that we have, uh, which are maybe things that we should have <laughs> all the time, uh, but these really kind of drive some of that periphery function uh, that, we, that we care quite a bit about. Echo is a system for uh, not, not taking and responding the same message, believe it or not, but actually for receiving and storing events. So anything out there can generate an event and send it over to Echo. Echo, in turn, will look at that event uh, and any uh, corresponding pipelines that are set to be triggered off of that event type, and then it can go off, and based off of that event, it can trigger a pipeline uh, via Orca. So for facilitating that kind of stuff, we have another project called Igor. And Igor is responsible for doing long pulling of external resources. And these can be things like a really good example is Jenkins. So Jenkins has a really nice integration with Spinnaker. Uh, if you're using Jenkins as your CI tool, uh, Igor can, uh, can be configured to pull your Jenkins instance uh, to, um, to see when your builds have completed. Your pipelines can be configured with a, with a Jenkins trigger so that uh, Any time that uh, Igor sees that a build has completed, it'll then send a message over to Echo, which in turn will kick off your pipeline. We're going to demo all this. I'm not just going to talk the whole time. Uh, but I wanted to give you this, this brief rundown so that you could see this is, uh, this is not, it's not child's play, right? We've, we've really thought through a lot of uh, the difficult problems of delivering software. And we've tried to do it in a way that's, that's sustainable and, um, and is able to scale with your organization. So a big part of that in... OpenStack land and, and in other lands that, that run uh, virtual machines is, uh, is we have this project called Roscoe. And Roscoe is effectively our bakery. And a bakery, what a bakery does is it takes any artifact that you've generated. Now you can, as part of your build, you can generate uh, any OS package, an RPM or a Debian file, for example. And you can publish that somewhere to a, a centralized Yum repository, for example, or to an app repo. And then Roscoe, uh, upon uh, seeing that you have generated this from, say, your, your Jenkins build, for example, uh, is able to look at that file, uh, understand what the, what the version of it is, and then kick off a bake. And what that does is it, it launches a new virtual machine with some, some configuration for a base image that you've created, uh, and then it'll go and install that package. Question? Can you compare that to, like, Packer? Yes. Uh, so the question was, can, uh, can I compare that to Packer? Uh, it actually uses Packer under the covers. Yep. So it's a, <laughs> so it's a way of, of, basically it's an adaptation layer for adapting Packer into the Spinnaker infrastructure. Yep. Uh, and, and to that end, it's, it's very configurable because you can configure the Packer templates to operate in exactly the way that you care about. Uh, and then finally we have Fiat, uh, which is basically an authentication and access control uh, microservice within, uh, within the Spinnaker platform. Uh, so basically, all of the services with APIs on them are able to integrate with Fiat uh, as, as a way of saying whether or not you should be able to access that API or not. And then we have uh, Gate, which is another creative name for the API gateway. And basically, this is the entry point. So all these are back-end services that are out there doing, doing the real work. Gate then sits in front of them and acts as the entry point to the platform. So if you're, building, uh, if you're building services that consume the Spinnaker API, for example, uh, to do something like, uh, like read data out of Spinnaker or to even go and trigger your own pipelines, you would communicate with these services through gate, right? Whereas if, if you think about a corollary with, with OpenStack, for example, there's uh, five or six uh, microservices that drive the OpenStack platform, and you go to the identity API, and it tells you about where all these other things live. Uh, instead, with Gate, Gate is just the central entry point to talk to all these backend services, right? And then DEC is the Spinnaker UI. Let's get to a demo. 
It's been 25 minutes. Let's look at something for real. So how, again, how many folks have actually used Spinnaker? Okay, a couple, great. So this is the UI, this is deck. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk through setting up a new application. And we'll call this application OpenStack Summit. Now, an important thing to understand about Spinnaker is that a lot of Spinnaker's infrastructure is driven via naming conventions. And that is a legacy artifact of the fact that uh, Amazon didn't always have tags <laughs> and didn't always have other data structures for representing metadata about, uh, about some resource. So there was a decision a long, long time ago at Netflix when they were, when they were first going to the cloud that a good way to tie things together uh, would be through these naming conventions. And it's really scaled very well, very impressively. Um, so for example, when we create a server group, it'll come through as the name of your application dash, and then some other detail, which we call a stack, uh, that'll create a new cluster for you, dash, and then it'll say like v000. And that's a sequence of, uh, of what number of server group it is. And that's a mechanism for defining ancestry to know which is an old version, which is a new version. So we'll, uh, we'll get to some of that. I'll just say Dan Woods at target.com. So anyway, my point with that is that if you try to put a dash in your name, it's gonna tell you that you can't do it, right? Which is cool. And so I only work in prod. So that was a joke. That was a tough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> we're, get, we're gonna get to the funny jokes, I promise. Okay, great. So we've, uh, we've created a project uh, called the OpenStack Summit. The very first thing that you can see is we're brought to the application page. Uh, and from here, we can see we have no server groups, right? We also have these options at the top for uh, accessing pipelines. We have no pipelines. Uh, and then we can see any tasks that have run. We have only done the one thing, which is create an application. So we can see that we've done that. And then over here we have load balancers, security groups, and the configuration about our application. So this touches on all those things that, that we covered as part of those, those model objects that Spinnaker cares about. There's an account, there's clusters, there's server groups. Server groups have instances, there's load balancers, there's security groups, right? Those are the things that matter. So very quickly, we can just come in here and say that we wanna do a deployment to prod, no stack, uh, you can choose the subnet that corresponds to the project that you have configured. Uh, these will just show up. Um, I was talking with Emily Burns earlier from, from Veritas, and she pointed out uh, that one of the really nice things about, about Spinnaker is that it auto-discovers the infrastructure, right? So this, this mechanism that it uses within CloudDriver for, for polling and and, uh, and cache in the details about your, your infrastructure and then tying it together means that you don't need to do a lot to get Spinnaker going in your environment, right? So you've presumably, you've created a subnet, you've created networks, you've created uh, all instance types, right? You have images that are available, this kind of stuff. Spinnaker will just auto understand that stuff once you fire it up against some good credentials in your project. So let's go ahead and choose something I'm just gonna choose a random instance type. And then I'm gonna say that I wanna launch against the target CentOS 7 latest image. And I'm just gonna get this fired up real quick. And then uh, I'll come back to that. We just wanna launch into, sorry, let me do one other thing real quick before I do that. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a load balancer. And this is great because creating load balancers in OpenStack is hard. So what we can see is this load balancer will be named OpenStack Summit, right? So it, it auto defaults to the name of our application. If we were deploying this into a particular stack, we could say that this is my web stack. You can see the naming convention follows along with it. I'm not gonna do that, but, and I will do something else and I'll just take this off, uh, set it to a, um, a TCP health check that will correspond to the uh, instance port that our application will run on. So we click that and we're presented with this really nice, real-time updated uh, task monitoring screen. And this will tell us about exactly what it's doing. So the first thing that it does is it goes and it creates the load balancer, right? The next thing that it does is it waits for CloudDriver to recognize that the load balancer has been created, which doesn't take very long at all. It's already done, I can tell you that. Uh, and then it does some extrapolation 
and then, uh, and then it refreshes the cache on demand. Great, and we're ready to go, right? Deleting a load balancer is equally as easy in Spinnaker, which is also hard to do in the UI. So it's a nice way of, of rounding out some of that infrastructure. So let's come back over here. Let's create a new server group. I'm gonna throw my load balancer on it, and then I'm gonna tell it that I wanted uh, uh, to, uh, to go to my default security group, which by default I open up completely, which we should all do, right? I'm not a security expert. I never claimed to be. Okay, so we'll click create. And, uh, and, and very similar to the creating of the load balancer, what this is doing is this is kicking off an orchestration that's going off and doing a, a set of what we call atomic operations. And these atomic operations are what's necessary for uh, getting these changes uh, enacted in our cloud. And I meant to have this up as well so that we could see it actually happening. We'll get there. Uh, yeah, so this is going on in the front. And now we're just waiting for some instances to come up. And they will. But in the meanwhile, while we're waiting for them to come up, uh, we can see that they're already there. We can even get some details about them. And these ones may not come up cleanly because I don't have anything in there. But so if we come over here, now we can see at our orchestration layer, we have some stacks. Let me go ahead and switch this so that this may look closer to what you have. Right. So we can see that we've created uh, a stack, right, which corresponds to our server group. We can see it's named exactly the same with a, with a certain number of uh, instances, one instance in this, in this case. And we can see that it's come up and it's just about ready to go. It's just waiting on a few other things uh, to happen behind the scenes. But at this point, we have an instance up. We have some IP addresses for it. We can see what security groups it's in. Uh, and we can see some details about it, right? If we look at the server group, we can see the launch configuration, what we actually launched, instance types, et cetera, et cetera. So with just a couple of clicks, we've created a new application, we've uh, created a load balancer, and we've deployed an image. That's pretty rad. And I'll also show you the load balancer, just to prove. I'm not, not tricking you. Here it is. Perfect, great. Looks great. Okay. Oh, start at the beginning. Okay. Now, again, one of the biggest, one of the biggest and nicest things that that Spinnaker really brings to the table for application teams uh, in terms of continuous delivery is not being able to click a lot of buttons, which is which is what I just showed you, um, but but is the ability to build these. Uh, these delivery pipelines, right? These, these kind of uh, robust things that will go off and do some stuff, right? So a very common approach uh, for a new application getting off the ground is to create what we call build, bake, deploy pipeline. And this is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. We build some version of the software, we bake it into an image, and then it deploys it automatically. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions? Nope, okay then we will uh, demo a basic delivery pipeline. So I have another application called Dan Test, which I created. And this has a simple build, bake, deploy pipeline, right? Exactly like what we just talked about. Uh, and basically off of this, what every pipeline has the capability of doing is uh, being triggered by some some change in state, right? Some external impetus to say, it, now, is it, now is a good time for this pipeline to run. And in this case, uh, we've configured it to work off of Jenkins. I've configured Igor uh, with a Jenkins master that I've created uh, and have handy. And I've given it the name of the job that I want it to uh, be able to trigger off of. Now in the background, what Spinnaker is gonna do is it's gonna pull this Jenkins install uh, against all the projects, but 
when it sees that, that this particular project has, has built something, uh, it'll pull that in and that'll, that'll trigger this pipeline that will in turn go off and bake this particular OS package. Now what I'm building is, is a, a, uh, uh, an RPM file and I'm publishing that out to a YUM repository that exists out there in the world. And I've configured that same target CentOS uh, 7 latest uh, image as the base image and I've, I've configured it with the name of CentOS 7 so that anything that my build produces, any RPM that my build produces is gonna be overlaid on top of that base image, right? Which is kind of nice. And then, uh, so once it's done baking, it'll then take that bake and, uh, and then it'll go out and deploy it. And one of the things that we get the capability of specifying as we're going through and doing these deployments uh, is what kind of strategy that we want to be able to enact as, uh, as part of the rollout, right? And this is where those deployment strategies come into play. Now you can build custom deployment strategies that correspond to your particular use case. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, but right out of the box, we have the ability to do what's known as a Highlander deploy. And basically what this says is, that, does anyone know the, the TV show Highlander? There can be only one, right? Maybe, maybe I'm getting a little old, but, uh, but basically what this will do is it'll go out and deploy the new version. Once the new version's out there and it comes up healthy and everything looks really good and it's ready to start taking traffic, then the pipeline will say, okay, new version's out there, it's up and running, and then it'll just go and destroy everything, just scorch earth the entire infrastructure. And that's kind of a nice thing, right? Especially if you're in dev, because you only want that, that one version. You only want the one, right? But I don't choose that. <laughs> not often, not for prod, which is where I live, right? Uh, another option is that you can say, I don't want any, and you can build, uh, you can build it into your pipeline, the mechanism that, that you have for cleaning up uh, the rest of your, your deployments that are out there. Uh, or you can just say, hey, every time that I build a new version, it's fine, I'll go and manually clean them up myself. And, and there are buttons in Spinnaker that I'll show you in just a second to be able to do that. Now the third option here is actually a really cool one. And this is something that uh, maybe, maybe some of you have come to know as blue-green deployments or uh, something along those lines. Uh, Netflix calls it red-black deployments. So in, in the earlier days of doing this kind of stuff, as I'm sure many folks here will remember, blue-green deployments were effectively a way of saying, I have an active environment and then I have a not active environment. And basically any time that you would, you would make a, a version change to your software, you would deploy it to the non-active version and then you would take uh, the active one out of the load balancer and, and put the new one in. And so that, that model doesn't really fit in, in an immutable world because basically what we're saying with immutable deployments is we're gonna create all new servers and then when we're done, we're gonna destroy all the old ones, right? There is no persistent state. It just is able to always be rebuilt uh, from, from that immutable state. So the idea with red-black deployments is that well, number one is that those are Netflix's colors, <laughs> right? So that was an, that was an easy choice. Um, but also is that uh, you, you have one, one active version and one uh, basically rollback version, a hot rollback, right? That allows you to, to, to get a new version up and running, keep the old one around but out of traffic rotation for some period of time. And then when you feel comfortable with, with, uh, with the new version, uh, then you can just go in and, and, and wipe out that old one. So that's, that's the one that I like the most because it allows you to keep that ancestor version around for some period of time um, and, and it won't just get rid of it. This is hands down the safest way to do it, especially when you consider this idea that we have the ability to just come in here. So, uh, so here, here's a red-black deployment, for example. The top one that you're looking at there is the one that's enabled. The bottom one, it's a little bit grayed out and you can see in the in the server group detail pane, it, it tells us that it's disabled. But what we have the ability to do is to come in here and say uh, that we want to go ahead and re-enable the old one uh, that, that we know is good, right? This is the ancestor version. And then come back to the new one, and in just a second when this one is, uh, is re-enabled, we can come over to this one and we can say we want to just go ahead and disable it. And we're just gonna lie to this for a sec. And so we can do that kind of hot rollback state in a very quick way, right? And, and for application teams, this is a really nice thing to be able to do um, because it, it lets you move. And that's the important part, right? Didn't Facebook say move fast and break stuff? Well, this, everything that Spinnaker is about is move fast, but don't break anything, 
right? Be incredibly safe, be very conservative. Don't destroy anything or ruin anything. So that's kind of a nice thing. Uh, so I have a load balancer hooked up to this guy. And what we can see here is, so now, now, we have, uh, now we have the newer version is out of rotation. We can see it's disabled, uh, it's instance went red, it's, it's very unhappy. Uh, but our old version's here. And I, this is just an application that has been created, packaged into an RPM and deployed uh, onto our base image. Uh, it's just an index.html file with Nginx, but it's pretty cool, right? I love writing apps like that. If I had some PHP in there, it would have been better. But what we have is, it just says, hello, OpenStack Summit, right? And it's got one exclamation mark, which is not nearly enough enthusiasm. So if I come over here and I enable it, then what I can say, and then I go ahead and disable this one, then what you'll see in just a second, it takes just a second because it's doing that polling behind the scenes and it's building up uh, this cache data, right? And, and we need the cache data because we don't wanna overwhelm these APIs every time that we wanna see something uh, or do something. And this UI will refresh in, in near real time, right? So it's, it'll refresh basically as fast as the cache can get updated. Uh, and, and so we, we have the cache in the background to do that kind of regular polling uh, that's not going to overwhelm the APIs behind the scene. So, this is way more enthusiastic, right? I've rolled back to the new version now, and now you can see it says, hello, OpenStack Summit, but we get two exclamation marks. That is rad, right? I know everyone loves that. Okay, cool. So, I have a Jenkins box. How much time do we have? Oh, we are? Okay, sorry. Okay, great. So I have a Jenkins box here that has a build, uh, and, uh, and this is building my project, and you can see that this project, uh, for build number nine, what I've done is I've, I've produced that RPM, and if we go to the pipeline, what we can see is that build nine was triggered, whoops, and it'll link me out to that. That would have been a faster way to get there. But we can see the details about what's happened here. And from within here, we can get those, those low-level packer details that tell us every, exactly everything that it was doing uh, to, to get that stuff installed. Uh, it, it installed our RPM. Our RPM said, hey, you should also install Nginx. And then it placed our index.html uh, in the right location. And the outcome of this is that we got an image ID. And that image ID, in turn, is what was passed off to the deploy stage. And that's pretty much how we do that. And I'm just going to jump back quickly. to my slides. Uh, while Dan's doing that, uh, I think we're going to wrap up soon. But um, since we've gone over, if anyone has any questions, uh, we'll just be out here at the, uh, the lounge, uh, Target-sponsored lounge. So if anyone has any questions, please come on out, and uh, we can hopefully help you out. Yes, so just the last thing I want to talk about really quick. So the immutable pipelines are a big deal. Another really big deal is these deployment strategies, right? So we talked about the red-black deploy, which, which fires up the new one, takes the old one out of, out of rotation. We talked about the Highlander, which scorched earths all the old stuff, right? Now, if you don't like any of those ways of doing things, and you or your organization or your project has a different way of doing it, you can build something called a deployment strategy, and then you'll get that drop-down option within, uh, within the UI, exactly the same as we saw the red black and we saw the Highlander. So you can build it that makes sense for you. And this can go off and do things like create a change ticket or uh, send an email to somebody or, uh, or any number of things that you could possibly conceive in your head. It can go off and destroy somebody else's project if you want it to. Uh, and uh, all, of, all of that comes for free out of the box. Now, currently for OpenStack, it's a work in progress. It, it works uh, currently with, with the other cloud providers. We'll get it there in the short term. Uh, it'll be good to go. Okay, great. So we'll call that wraps. All right. Thank you all very Thanks, much. Thanks, everyone.